The ornate tree kangaroo is one of the seven species of kangaroos that learn to climb. As this group of animals spread into new areas, the ornate variety was the one which reached furthest north, colonizing the lands of New Guinea. The kangaroos were the result of millions of years of adaptations in order to survive out on the open plains. Why then did they return to the trees with the enormous renewed effort to adapt that that implies? There is no clear answer. Probably in order to get at the tempting foods which are out of reach, high up in the trees. When the slow evolutionary changes began, those kangaroos had no competitors for the leaves at the top of the trees. The plains were very extensive and the food sources scarce, so new types of kangaroos began to appear with different features. Stronger front legs, powerful claws, and finally the ability to move each one of its four legs independently, something which no kangaroo down on the ground is able to do. At the same time, the different kangaroos that had invaded the plains were in competition with each other. But as the climate became increasingly temperate and there was ever more open land, the kangaroos, which had developed a digestive system capable of assimilating the tough grasses, continued to expand. And at the same time, some trees also adapted to the increasingly temperate climate of Australia. And one in particular, the eucalyptus, was so successful that it spread throughout the continent, from north to south, creating a new type of forest. And as soon as this new habitat appeared, there was a marsupial ready to take advantage of it. The koala was able to colonize the eucalyptus forests thanks to an adaptation which would seem impossible the ability to feed on its leaves. The leaves of the eucalyptus tree are a combination of low quality food, indigestible material and active poisons. Any animal that could adapt and make use of these leaves would have absolutely no competitors and that is precisely what the koala did. Taking care of the young is especially complicated in this world of toxin-laden foods. After completing their development in the mother's pouch, breastfeeding for six months long, the time comes for the cubs to be weaned and start feeding on the eucalyptus leaves. At this time, the mother excretes special soft feces, a kind of pulp of half-digested leaves which she uses to feed her young. As well as nourishing them, these feces inoculate the young with the microorganisms they will need for this difficult digestion. From then on, they will become independent from their mothers. For most part of the day, the koalas rest among the branches of the trees. This is part of their metabolic strategy. As the food is very poor, nothing better than to rest for 20 hours a day and be able to function with the least expenditure of energy. Their specially adapted digestive system takes care of the rest. 500 grams of these poisonous leaves a day are enough to keep a koala going. On the ground, the koalas are clumsy and vulnerable. Their feet, which are designed for climbing, are not made for walking on four legs. So they only leave the safety of the branches to move from one tree to another in search of more food or a female ready to mate. The koala is an example of the incredible versatility of adaptation of the marsupial mammals of Australia. But what happened to the monotremes, those primitive mammals which were also part of the exodus of Terra Australis, along with the marsupials in those distant days of Gondwana?
Some scientists consider them the losers. Others, perhaps more romantically, prefer to believe that they simply retired from the constant competition among mammals and chose to live just as they had for millions of years, discreetly, almost anonymously, in the most remote corners of the dense jungles, at their own pace and indifferent to the rest of the world. Today, in the entire world, there are only three existing species of these archaic mammals that lay eggs. Two of them are echidnas, the long-snouted variety in New Guinea, and this one, the short-snouted variety, which can be found throughout Australia. The third member of the family is the strangest mammal known to man, the duck-billed platypus, a shy animal which lives in some rivers in the east of Australia. The rivers of Australia were no exception in the parallel evolution which has taken place over the 50 million years that Australia has been travelling alone across the Indian Ocean. Fish and invertebrates acquired new forms, some of them as strange as the Neoceratodus, the Australian lunged fish whose origins go back to the Devonian era, approximately 350 million years ago. But the most extraordinary creature now living in the rivers of Australia originally developed on land. The duck-billed platypus looks like an impossible compendium of different zoological types. From the time Dawson sent his controversial sample to the British Natural History Museum, there were constant scientific discussions, lasting for over a hundred years, until finally two zoologists demonstrated irrefutably that they were indeed mammals and reproduced by laying eggs. Although they are small in size, the duck-billed platypuses would seem to have an insatiable appetite. This one has found a river crab. Crustaceans, mollusks, annelids, and even amphibians form part of their extremely varied diet. And their peculiar morphology means they are able to hunt their prey even in muddy waters. Using its webbed feet and broad muscular tail to propel itself along, the archaic platypus searches the river bottom. The sensors on its beak detect the slightest movement or change in temperature. Any animal crawling or swimming along the riverbed is rapidly located and, if it is of any interest, devoured. In the rivers of Australia, the platypus is so well adapted it has no competitors, or rather, almost none. As in so many other environmental niches, the placentary mammals have also come up with a prototype. On this occasion, the result of the evolutionary process was the water rat or beaver rat, which was able to thrive in the aquatic world thanks to its waterproof fur and partially webbed feet. Strangely, no marsupial tried to colonize the rivers of Australia, and so the freshwater resources of this continent are shared between the modern water rat and the archaic duck-billed platypus. The Aborigines who arrived in Australia 50,000 years ago already knew the duck-billed platypus, which they named the water mole. A very appropriate name, given that the platypus lives out its amphibious life between the water, where it finds food, and the riverbanks, where it digs its tunnels. 